you so much for joining us for today's class. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida. That's in Central Florida over on the West Coast, just north of the greater Tampa Bay area. If any of you are brand new to these classes, you've never attended one of our classes before, that's great. Welcome, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we do a lot of online classes on a whole variety of different lawn and garden and vegetable gardening, fruit tree, everything else topics. And today we're gonna to be talking about growing herbs at home, which is obviously a very popular topic because we had so many people sign up for it. Growing herbs at home is very, very easy. So no matter where you live in Florida, you can grow herbs, but most of the specific timing I'm gonna give you is for generally central Florida. If you live a lot further south of here, uh, Southwest Florida, Broward County, Miami County, down in the Keys, whatever it might be, you can grow herbs also, but your seasons and your temperatures are a little bit different down there. And heading in the other direction, if you live up in the Florida Panhandle, up in the Jacksonville, North Florida area, spring comes a little bit later there. So the timing and the seasons are gonna be a little bit different from what they are here. But a lot of this information is gonna to apply to everybody and the different herbs that you can grow at different times of year are gonna to apply to you. It's just keep in mind, your spring may not be the exact same as my spring here in Hernando County. So it might make a little bit of a difference. So here, let's start off with some pictures of some beautiful herb gardens. I took these pictures at the um, University of Florida Extension office over in Sumter County, which is right next door to us. And they have a demonstration garden out in front of their office. They have vegetable row crops going and a huge herb garden. This is something that they built. They included the little beds there and their herbs are doing extremely well. I was so jealous from how good they look and how much herbs they have. The one kind of in the center there with the fairly large leaves is thyme. Oh my gosh, if I had thyme that looked like that, I'd be drying the heck out of it and storing it and I would have enough time for my food and recipes and cooking to last a lifetime. So you can grow herbs very easily, very well. You can end up with a lot of herbs and make very, very good use of them. That's all parsley right in the center there and uh, the sage up in the corner. The one that's flowering with little flower balls on top is some type of chives, either garlic chives or onion chives. I think onion chives, but I'm not positive. So. You can do it. Herbs can grow very, very well here, either in the ground, these are purely in the ground, or also in containers. So when we're talking about herbs, what exactly are herbs? Generally, herbs are any plants that are used for food or flavoring or medicine. Some of these use in medicine, and we do not give out medical advice on it, but many of them are important in medicine, or perfume, because they have a very nice scent also. So culinary use typically distinguishes herbs from spices. If you ever wondered what's an herb, what's a spice, technically they are different. So the definition, an herb is anything where you're using the leafy green part of the plant, either fresh or dried, doesn't matter. A spice is something that you use from another part of the plant. That could be uh, the seeds, the berries, the bark, the roots. Cinnamon is tree bark from a cinnamon tree. So cinnamon is a spice. Um, parsley, basil, something like that. You use the green leafy part, so it's an herb. Um, if you save the seeds from cilantro, technically that would be a spice, but many people might still consider it an herb. So doesn't really matter a whole, a whole lot, but what we're talking about mostly today is herbs, things that you can grow in your yard and eat or make some kind of use of. And we're gonna go through the, the common ones that grow here. There's a few that I don't really cover that are a little oddball that will still do well here too. So herbs have been very, very important for thousands of years. Pretty much every different culture around the world has used either wild or cultivated herbs for some kind of medicinal use, food purposes, 
if you think of any kind of ethnic foods, whatever restaurant you may go to or whatever types of food, maybe um, your family cooks or you cook, when we talk about like Italian food, you instantly think of the type of herbs that go into it. Greek food, Asian cuisine, Thai food, whatever, they all make use of different herbs that are all very, very important for adding flavoring. So herbs go back all the way to the uh, very, very beginning of the Bible. So we've been using them and growing them for quite a long time. They're very versatile. You can use them for a lot of different things. So along with using them for flavoring foods in cooking, you can use them to make teas. I'm not really the expert on different types of herbal teas, but I know it's very popular. And I know that you can buy already dried and mixed things. You can make mixtures between regular tea leaves and different herbs, different spices. A lot of them really do have a lot of very, very important health benefits. Research is just now kind of scraping the surface to figure out what all the different individual specific unique phytochemicals, what impacts they have on our physical bodies. They can, uh, so I'm not gonna sit here and try to tell you that they're gonna cure lots of diseases. It's kind of a cure-all wonder thing. We don't wanna put that kind of snake oil salesman information out there. Like I said, if you look up the legitimate research, more is coming out every day of the health benefits from the phytochemicals. These are the specific things that are inside the herbs. Aromatherapy, very, very important for relaxing and feeling better. The scents, you know, it's breathing them in and smelling them. Different herbs can repel insects. They're um, making uh, mosquito repellents and insect repellents out of herbs. Please don't think that if you plant herbs in your yard and they're growing, that's going to keep mosquitoes out of your yard. Doesn't really work like that. A plant 10 feet away doesn't really impact you or me or a mosquito. Mosquitoes going to look like, I don't care. I'm not going to land on the plant. Maybe I think the plant smells bad, so I'm not going to chew on it. But mosquitoes don't chew anyway. What you can do with herbs, certain herbs, and they're you know working on formulations of this, is if you crush them, rub them on your body, it might help deter insects because now you smell really bad to that insect. They don't want to land on you or bother you. And there are other um, benefits of growing and using herbs also. So growing herbs here in Florida, where are you going to grow them? Location is very, very important. Almost all herbs with really only one or two exceptions I can think of that we're gonna talk about like and really need a full sun location. Almost all herbs require good drainage. There's almost no herbs that do well in really, really wet soil or uh, whether that be in a container or in your yard. So if you live in an area where sections of your yard or your entire yard, you have very poor drainage, after it rains, the water kind of piles up and there's standing water there. Herbs are not gonna do very well in that spot. They're gonna develop root rot very quickly and probably die very quickly. On the other hand, if you're growing them in containers, that works really, really well. Almost all herbs are small plants or you can keep them as small plants. So all you need is reasonable sized pots to grow them in. Anything from a one gallon pot on up. The bigger the pot, the more herbs you can put in it. And if you go to a lawn and garden center now, you'll find a huge variety of large pots and containers, everything from half wooden whiskey barrels to very large lightweight plastic pots. You can fill a potting soil. You can put a whole variety. You can put an entire herb garden in one really, really big container. Just match the herbs properly, put a variety of them in quality potting soil, and you're going to be good to go. A couple little cautions about that. Be very careful not to overwater them if they're in pots, because if you go back to what I already said about them not doing well in a wet spot, we've always found that a lot of people, and this applies to house plants, 
vegetables in containers and herbs in containers, people tend to overwater things growing in pots. Not me. I underwater them. I forget about it and mine dry out really bad and they're wilting. I guess I need to go over there and water it now. But a lot of people are more diligent than me and they go and water it a little bit every day. That's probably going to be too much. So if you're growing herbs or anything else in containers or pots, water as needed, but be careful to not overwater. You want to use a quality potting soil, something that drains very well, drains all the excess water out, let it completely dry out, then water it again thoroughly where you wet the soil all the way from top to bottom, and you should be fine. So when it comes to soil and fertilizer, like I said, you want to use a well-drained uh, potting soil, or if you're going to plant them in the ground, like the pictures I showed at the very beginning, that works just great also. Herbs are very easy to kind of tuck in and sneak in the corners and edges of other flower beds that you may already have in your yard with landscape plants, flowers. Herbs are going to do fairly well mixed in with anything. There's not many plants that they don't get along well with, basically. So if you're a little short on space, you live in a homeowner's association, you can't dig a big herb garden or vegetable garden, They can you can kind of tuck them in here, sneak them in there, put a few in containers out in the backyard on your porch or patio, and there's always room for at least a couple of herbs. So if you're growing in the ground, herbs grow best in very well-drained soil, generally a neutral pH, so not extremely acidic, not extremely alkaline. You can always get a soil test done from University of Florida to find out what the pH of your soil is. To get that done, if you live in Hernando County, please contact us. I'll have my contact information at the end. If you live in a different county, contact your county extension office because all 67 counties in Florida have an extension office. So if you live in Florida, doesn't matter where, you have an extension office you can contact and say, hey, how do I go about getting a soil test? I need to know what my pH is and they'll get you set up. If you're growing in containers, use quality potting soil. Sometimes the cheap stuff or the stuff that used to be 99 cents a bag, I don't even, it may not even be 99 cents a bag now. It's probably more expensive. The real cheap potting soil, if you pick it up, it's really heavy, it's wet. Kind of take a sniff. If it smells really bad, don't buy it. Buy the better potting soil because it's going to drain better. Really wet, skunky, nasty potting soil probably now contains nasty bacteria and other stuff in it. It's not the right consistency. It's kind of mud. Don't buy the cheap stuff. Pay a little bit more. Get the good potting soil. Your plants will thank you for it. Almost all herbs are very light feeders, so they don't need a lot of fertilizer. And in fact, a lot of them, a heavy fertilizer is going to damage them and they're not going to grow as well or produce as well. But it does help to fertilize them very lightly. So if you get any kind of liquid fertilizer, a miracle grow type product, heaters, um, plant food, there's a lot of water soluble fertilizers out there where you take, read the directions. If it says you take one tablespoon per gallon of water, mix it up at like half strength. So half of that per gallon of water, mix it up really well. So fertilize it with a weak solution, maybe once a month. You really don't have to fertilize herbs much more than that. And if they're growing in the garden, outdoors, you can use a granular fertilizer, but just very, very light scattering. Like I said, most herbs where they naturally originated from and naturally grow, it's not really, really wet, rich, heavy, organic soil. So they're used to being a little bit on the dry side and not getting a whole lot of fertilizer. So when it comes to watering, watering requirements kind of vary with what kind of herbs you're trying to grow. And I'm going to go through a number of them and I'll mention whether it likes water or not so much. Remember, the biggest mistake with anything growing in a container is overwatering. 
The exception to this that you need to remember, if you try growing any kind of mints, spearmint, peppermint, orange mint, chocolate mint, there are a huge number of different, slightly different smelling and tasting varieties of mint that you can grow. Mints naturally like a wetter soil, so they like it kind of damp all the time, and they like a little bit of shade because where do mints naturally grow in the environment? They tend to grow in kind of moist areas near creeks, brooks, things like that, underneath some trees, so they're getting partial shade. So mints are the exception. If you let them get way too dry, they're gonna wilt and they may not come back. So mints like it a little bit damper and a little bit shadier, but other than that, any one of those different flavored mints can grow very, very well here in Florida. So some different really common herbs are fall under the grouping of Mediterranean herbs because that's where they naturally originated from. And in the Mediterranean and the weather in California is Mediterranean climate type weather also, they have hot dry summers, and then cool, wet winters. So if you've been in Florida for any length of time, what kind of weather do we have here? Here we have hot, very, very wet summers with very high humidity and cooler, very dry winters. So we're kind of the opposite, not 100% opposite, but we're different. We're not exactly like the weather is in the Mediterranean where all these different plants come from. And if you look at this list, things like rosemary, oregano, marjoram, thyme, sage, these are all things that you put on pizza. It's, they're all important in Italian cooking or Greek or Syrian or North African. So it's all, they're all used in recipes and foods from that general area because that's where they grow and they grow really well there couple that kind of fall under Mediterranean herbs, but you know, just in case you're interested, where, where the heck did they come from? Basil originally came from India, but it likes generally the same type of weather. Lemon balm, if anybody's familiar with that, is European. Chives are European. And then lavender, I hate to tell you this, and I hate to be the one to give you the bad news, lavender does not grow well in Central Florida. Lavender grows even worse in South Florida. In the Panhandle, you can grow lavender. It's tough. If you live out in Idaho, maybe Kansas, maybe Oregon, states out there, lavender grows great. Sorry, it does not grow well here in Florida. You could try growing it. Some people say there's certain varieties that do better really, really hard to grow here because during the summer, it's very sunny, very hot, very wet, frequent rains, and very humid. It's the wet and humid that will do in your lavender. And all these other herbs in this list here, rosemary, oregano, marjoram, thyme, and sage, and all the others, there's a good chance they're going to suffer some during uh, the summer. When it gets really sunny, hot, wet, rainy, humid, they're going to suffer and maybe even die back a little bit because they don't really like that kind of weather. They're used to having it on the drier side. So if you're growing your herbs outdoors and we have a very, very wet, rainy July and August, that may be too much water and that's going to make them unhappy. They're used to drier. You can't let them go without water, but you don't want to overwater them. And they're used to um, much less humid, so they may suffer. They may suffer the um, same problems and die back a little bit. So going through some of these individually, rosemary, very easy to grow here. And rosemary is kind of unusual. It's an evergreen perennial shrub. If you get a rosemary plant, you can grow it in a pot, but keep repotting it. And if you can, put it in progressively bigger and bigger pots it will grow into a four foot tall bush. And if you take care of it really well and everything goes well, it will live for many, many years. And you could take any one of those little branches or stalks on there, trim them off, clip them off, 
fresh rosemary is very oily, almost like a evergreen shrub. And that's great in rosemary bread, Italian cooking, a lot of different recipes, a lot of different uses. And it smells great. If you're growing it, if you go by and you just kind of rub it or brush it, you can get the scent from it. Smells really, really good. Makes your hands smell good. Rosemary, if you're growing it either in a container or in the ground outdoors, and we flood or we have a tropical storm or we just get a couple months of extra heavy rain, it may develop a root rot problem. It may even die. It happens. It's going to be really unhappy because it does not like to sit in mud, basically. So if you grow it in a container, you may want to put it in a spot, if you can, where it's not really getting much natural rainfall. You have to water it. That way you control how much water it gets. Or keep it outside, put it out there, let it get rained on, save some time and money and don't have to drag the water out. But if you could tell things are getting really, really wet, maybe move the container to a, a covered area or at least underneath a tree where it's going to get less water. Because these, really the only thing that's going to kill them is too much water. Nice thing about growing herbs is they have very, very few insect pests. They have a few, but not a lot. They have very fungal, very few fungal disease problems also. The most common problem for any kind of herb is going to be a root rot, and that is caused by sitting in soil that is just way too wet for it. Oregano. Oregano grows great here. There is Greek oregano, Italian oregano. Uh, a little hard to tell from this picture. That's, it does flower. It attracts bees. It has very, very small leaves. So you cut little shoots or branches off and kind of pull the leaves off with your fingers. Oregano is essential for pizzas, any kind of Italian food, uh, any kind of Mexican, Central American food. Oregano is very, very useful. And it's very, very easy to grow. It's just like the rosemary I mentioned. It will decline a bit during the summer. It's less happy outside giving it a little bit of shade, controlling the water going on it is going to help kind of nurse it through or help it to make it through the summer. Once we get into fall, boom, these herbs love fall weather. They love spring weather. Winter weather isn't bad. If we get a major freeze, that's going to be a problem for them. They can and will freeze, but it's mostly the summertime weather that's going to be a problem for all of them. Marjoram is one that maybe not all of you have heard about or use. Maybe you don't have a bottle of it in your spice rack, but marjoram is very closely related to oregano, but it is a slightly different smell and taste and flavoring from it. Marjoram grows really well here. It's another Mediterranean herb that can be bothered by too much water in summertime weather. Thyme, same thing. Um, if you ever, if you've been to the grocery store recently, or what, next time you go to the grocery store, go by the herb section, look at the prices on things like thyme and sage. For a small bottle of dried, it's several dollars. The price has just gone through the roof. If you grow some herbs on the side at home, any one of them, once they get large enough and you start harvesting them, you can, you know, flip the branches off, take the leaves. Dry it, dehydrate it, grind it up, make your own dried herbs. You can save a huge amount of money and your homegrown and home dried herbs, you know exactly what went on them and what went into them. And they're probably going to be fresher and taste better than what you get at the store anyway. So I was shocked the last time I looked at the price on time. And the last time I looked at the price on sage, it was like, it, it may have been the brand, but it was probably like $4 for a little bottle. It was ridiculous. And sage is very, very easy to grow. It gets slightly larger leaves. Very, very uh, pretty and attractive in the garden, too. It has kind of um, silvery gray leaves. So you can actually, if you live in a um, subdivision with the Homeowners Association, all you have is garden beds out front. Tuck it in the garden beds out front. People are going to go, oh, what a pretty plant. What a nice flower bed you have there. 
they'll never know that you're growing it to eat it. I think that's what drives HOA people crazy. So just don't tell them, grow it, easy to grow. Essential, it's the main ingredient. If you ever purchase poultry seasoning, you need sage for that. You need sage for the, the Thanksgiving and holiday turkey also. Basil, basil is super easy to grow, grows like a weed, grows really, really well here in the spring and in the fall. Summer tends to be too hot. Winter tends to be too cold when the temperatures start to get cold. We get cold fronts through. If you look at a um, seed catalog or if you're looking at purchasing your herb seeds online, basil is very easy to start from seed. They have old fashioned Italian basil. They have purple basil, they have Thai basil, they have lemon basil, they have cinnamon basil. I can go on for a while and only remember half of them off the top of my head. A lot of different types of basil. They all taste a little bit different. They all look a little bit different. Obviously purple basil is purple. Some of them glow basil will grow into a, a very nice round, almost like a small bush or shrub with really small leaves. So you'll get a big harvest off of it. So go out there and experiment and try growing as many different kinds of basil as you can. You're gonna be able to use all of them for something. You can dry them, use them fresh. Basil is really, really important in Thai cuisine, very important in any kind of Italian, Greek cuisine, very, very useful. And there's a huge number of different varieties available. Like I said, during the summer, it's a little tough because the heat makes them go to seed very, very quickly. Some people make the mistake thinking, okay, I'm gonna do like that guy said and buy a basil plant. I'm gonna put it in a pot, I'm gonna grow it and it's gonna grow for 10 years. Basil doesn't naturally grow like that. It comes up quickly, grows quickly, looks like the picture here has lots of leaves, that is when you want to pick the basil, the leaves, that's when it tastes the best. Not long after that, it gets taller, starts sending out little flowers. That's okay. You can clip the flowers off and encourage it to make more leaves because that's the part that you're going to actually dry or eat fresh. It's not too long before it just keeps wanting to make flowers. At that point, your basil is pretty much done. Plant more. Or if you want, in the spring, plant some basil. Two weeks later, plant a little bit more. Two weeks later, plant a little bit more. You're gonna have this continuous harvest of basil and you're always gonna have a really good fresh harvest. Don't think that you can keep basil plants going for months or years on end. Does not work like that. Once they're doing nothing but producing flowers, you know, you could just let them go. Let them flower. They flower very well. Bees appreciate that. Bees will visit all different herbs when they flower. Very popular with honeybees. That's good too. Let it flower and set seed. Cut the branches off, save the seeds. Now you have free seeds for growing basil again next year. The seeds are all viable and they do very, very well. So a couple little hints about uh, basil there. Lemon balm is mostly used for teas and flavoring. It can be used to flavor candies, I believe. It's safe to eat fresh if you like lemon flavor in um, salads or fruit salads, things like that. Lemon balm is great in that. I pulled this picture off of Amazon. So obviously lemon balm is very popular to be used as a tea. So you can grow this, you can use the leaves fresh for a tea. If you have too much, Go ahead and dry them. Lots of information online about how to dry herbs. You could do it in your oven. If you have, uh, if you own or have access to a dehydrator, they work very, very well also. Dry it until the leaves are completely dry and crunchy. Put it in a, uh, a blender, a grinder, a mortar and pestle if you need to, to grind it up. Put it in an airtight container and you're good to go. Now you're actually saving your herbs to be able to use long-term. That's a great way to extend the harvest. So lemon balm is another one that you can grow very easily here. I've tried growing it before. They get, 
they can get fairly large. They'll get a couple feet tall and grow very quickly. So another good one. Chives. Chives are very easy to grow. Chives are in the same uh, plant family. They're alliums. So they're very closely related to onions and garlic. So there are onion chives and garlic chives. When you look at the little green leaves there, if all the leaves are flat, and if you run your finger over it, they're kind of flat, there's probably a garlic chive. If you look at it and the leaves are all round and hollow inside, probably an onion chive. Not a whole lot of difference between the two. I'm sure some people can notice the difference, but I've never noticed that there was a huge difference between the two. They grow very easily here, very well. They'll grow in a little clump. When the leaves grow and get a few inches tall, go in with scissors, carefully snip them off. They'll grow more leaves. Snip them off, they'll grow more leaves. You can keep that going. Um, you can have a patch of chives go for a couple of years. Weather, whether it's, you know, really super cold weather in the winter, really super hot spell during the summer, if they're getting too much sun, may kill them and kind of end their their lives, their, you know, longevity. But you can keep a patch of chives going where you're just trimming and eating and letting them regrow for quite some time. Very easy to grow. So there are some other herbs that grow here. And some of these maybe you never heard of or you're not really that familiar with, but they're going to be a little bit different. These guys are not Mediterranean herbs. But still, they're herbs and they're very, very useful. Lemongrass, and lemongrass is used in Thai cuisine, uh, Chinese cooking. It's um, native to Southeast Asia, I believe. And lemongrass is a very attractive ornamental grass. I have a couple clumps in my backyard. I didn't bother to take a picture of them because they're pretty brown and frozen right now. They will freeze back during the winter, and that's fine, that's okay. They grow, you really can't see from the picture, from, from a clump growing out of the ground, what I'm gonna do as soon as I get a chance to, this year I'm just gonna cut them all the way back to the ground. Give them a real tight haircut, shave them down, let them grow back. By the end of summer, they're waist high. They get at least four feet tall. The clumps over time get bigger and bigger. Very attractive plump or ornamental grass. You know, many of you may have African iris and a few other type of uh, ornamental grasses in your front yard. You know, if you pulled them up and replaced them with lemongrass, you could actually harvest the lemongrass, the really thick shoots cut down at ground level, peel off all the outer leaves and the inside stem or pulp you could finally dice up and throw in your Thai cuisine. A lot of people will take the leaves and tie them up in a beautiful little bundle and steep them in hot water and um, make lemongrass tea. I'm sure at least somebody on here who will probably share in the comments about how they do that. And it's very, very good. So lemongrass loves summer weather here. It grows like a weed during the summer. When it's hot and rainy, and steamy and everything, the lemongrass is perfectly happy and will do really well. Cuban oregano, and we did uh, some things on Facebook Live recently. I have a very large Cuban oregano plant of my own. This is a tropical plant. Technically, it is not botanically the same or even really closely related to Greek or Italian oregano. It's very attractive. It grows, um, doesn't really grow vines, but grows very long shoots with dark green or light green with either white along the edges or white patches leaves. The leaves are kind of thick and fleshy. You can harvest those leaves, chop them up, smells and tastes just like oregano. Cuban oregano is one of the essential ingredients if you're co cooking Cuban food. So for any kind of Cuban pork, you need Cuban oregano, black beans and rice, Cuban oregano. Stuff grows like a weed during the summer. If you grow some in a small pot, 
All you have to do is start off with just a very, very small cutting. And this stuff, the cuttings root like a weed. Like I said, if you go back to our Facebook page, we do have some videos on there about this. Easy to root. It will freeze back during the winter. So you have to be very, very careful. These do best in containers, a very large container. That way you can either cover it or carry the container in when it's going to freeze. Because if these things freeze, they will completely die and not come back. I did that two years ago and lost them. And then I found a couple little tiny shoots on the ground next to the, where the pots were, transplanted them, put them in a large pot. By the end of summer, that thing was flowing out all over the place. I have more Cuban oregano than I could possibly ever use. So you want to keep them from freezing weather, bring it inside when it's going to freeze, put it outside all summer long. It loves the rain, the heat, humidity. Like I said, it's going to grow like a weed. Has, if it has any pests or diseases, I've never seen them, never had a problem with them. So there are some herbs that you probably want to grow and you can grow, but you're not going to start planting them right now because this is the middle of March. We have a few things like dill, parsley, and cilantro that are cool season herbs, and they grow great here in Central Florida during the winter. Start them in September or October, grow them all winter long. You can pick them, harvest them, they're gonna grow back, plant more, keep them going, dry them. You can dry dill, you could dry parsley, uh, you can dry cilantro. Let some of your cilantro go to seed. And that way uh, the seeds are, if you take the seeds and grind them, that is what cumin is. So there's a lot of things you can do with them all winter long. But once we get up into spring, these guys are all gonna decline. They're gonna flower, they're gonna bolt. They're not gonna taste nearly as good. So you have to grow them for yourself during the winter. Now, there are things that you could do with them once we start to get up into spring right now. Realize that my share of dill, parsley, and cilantro, it's over. I had dill all winter long. I dried it. You could freeze it in ice cubes. You could preserve it a lot of different ways, but it's kind of over for me. Because what happens is once we start to get into spring really soon, um, dill, and parsley will get these great big caterpillars on them. A common name for them is parsley worms. And you can see it's a huge caterpillar. They're up, they're pretty, they're brightly colored. You really don't want to be killing these caterpillars. That's your choice. But if you're ever wondering, I wonder what those caterpillars turn into. Should I try to pick them off by, you know, dill and parsley and keep it going into the summer, even though it tastes bad? I got nothing but flowers and seeds, or should I be a nice guy and just kind of let the caterpillars have all of them? Well, if you have any kind of uh, butterfly garden, these caterpillars turn into the Eastern black swallowtail. Its host plant or native food is wild species of different types of parsley and dill. We have different weeds that are in the dill family that the caterpillars for the black swallowtails naturally feed on. But they're more than happy to feed on the ones in your garden also. So probably the smartest thing you could do is grow dill, parsley, and harvest it all winter long. Once we get to spring, go, okay, I'm going to move you to my butterfly garden. I'm going to let the caterpillars eat all the leaves off of you. And now I'm going to have all these big, beautiful eastern black swallowtail butterflies flying all over my garden. And everything is going to work out great. So that's probably a pretty good plan to follow for your herb garden. So if you wanna follow any of our other upcoming classes, if you've never attended one of these before, or you're not sure exactly what the heck we normally do here, best place to go to get information for that is just go to www.hernandoextension.com. And that is a freestanding uh, web page that's fed from our Facebook page and is gonna have information on all of our upcoming classes as we schedule them. The links, if they're free, if there's a charge, is it on Zoom? Do I have to register on Eventbrite? Is it on Facebook Live? All those questions are answered there. If I miss a link or miss something, 
just send me an email and I'll go back in and fix it. Every once in a while, I get in a rush and I do. But generally, all the information you need is going to be right there. And if you ever have any questions, uh, here's our office phone number. We are Hernando County Extension Service. We are in Brooksville, Florida. Here's my email. That is by far the best way to get in touch with me. If you try calling me, you may or may not get a hold of me. So um, please be sure to uh, send an email uh, with any other questions. Let me go ahead and stop sharing this. And I see that the recording is still working correctly there. So let me get out of this in the background. And come back in here. Oh my goodness. You guys have a lot of questions in the chat. So let me scroll up here all the way to the very top. Suzanne asked before we started, she lives in Broward County. Will most of this information apply to you also? Yes, it does. Keep in mind that you, depending on where, where in Broward you are, you're not going to freeze down there. And your winter weather is going to be beautiful for almost all these herbs we talked about. You should be able to grow all of them all winter long. Summer will be tough on the Mediterranean herbs. So you, and you may have to adjust your planting times, but almost everything that I covered will pretty much apply to Broward also. Frances says that she's new to her native county and exciting to make her entire front yard an herb garden. That's great. And, you know, if you look up more information, University of Florida has a lot of information. There are a lot of ways that you can dry them. You can freeze them. You can preserve them. You can save them. You can use them in so many different ways because if you're going to grow a lot of them, you don't want them to go to waste. So you want to be sure to, to make use ideally of all the herbs that you grow. How many hours of sun a day is considered full sun? That is a good question. They say generally six hours a day of the sun shining on them is considered full sun. Things that help, if you plant things underneath a big oak tree, that's not full sun. That's perfect for azaleas and things that like speckled sun, but that's not full sun. If you have a spot in your yard that gets full sun on it from first thing in the morning until early afternoon, that's perfect. Because in the summer, if you get a little bit of shade in the late afternoon, when it's really, really sunny, the sun is really intense, it's really hot, that is going to help most plants. Most plants appreciate that little kind of break from the heat in the afternoon. So technically, six hours a day is full sun. Um, in your opinion, would you stay in Central Florida to plant herbs on pots or in the ground? I grow them in pots. I put all my herbs in containers. I can regulate the water they're getting that way. I can regulate exactly where they physically sit. I have a partly shady spot underneath some palm trees. If things need more sun and they're in a container, I can move them out in the full sun, move them part way back. So I have a lot of flexibility with it. And herbs generally stay, herbs never get really tall. They never get a really huge root system like a tomato or pepper or something like that would. So they're really ideal for containers. And if you have a back porch or a patio area or an area around your pool, there's so many selections with different attractive containers you can grow things in. You can get them all in matching colors, contrasting colors, have the kids paint them. If you're, if you're very crafty, I'm not crafty at all. But if you are, you can make them look attractive. Put herbs in them so they're productive. That's going to be absolutely perfect. While it may not technically be an herb, what about garlic? Garlic does grow very well here in Florida. In Central Florida, you must grow it during the winter. It does not grow from spring through fall because it will rot in the soil. You plant it in the fall, it grows until the spring, and right around now, middle of, April, middle of March to middle of April is when you're going to harvest it. Elephant garlic grows well here, and 
if you look online for different um, uh, distributors and seed companies online, you can purchase garlic. They're going to send you like a bulb and you break it up into the little pieces, plant each individual piece. Ideally, it's going to grow. Use the green part too. The green, don't throw that green part away. Use that in soups, stews. It's good for you. It's tasty. And then hopefully you have a big garlic bulb underground that you're able to harvest and make use of. So yeah, garlic. Garlic would technically be a spice, I believe, and not an herb because you're using the root. So. And Suzanne asked, can the Mediterranean herbs grow here in winter? Yes, they do really, really well here in winter almost all the time. If we we're going to get temperatures in the mid 20s, all bets are off. They're, they're probably going to be pretty seriously damaged from the cold. That's another benefit of growing things in pots or containers. You can move them to a warmer spot. So if you're able to, you can move them inside. You can move them in the garage. If it's too big to move, you can throw a cover over it much easier. For things, I have things that are growing in pots outside. I have extra um, recycling bins. So when it got really cold this past winter, I've covered things. I put like um, a bath towel over the plant and a recycling bin on top of it. They did just great, kept them warm, kept them fine. So um, Mediterranean herbs, when it gets really cold, they can freeze, but the rest of our mild, pleasant wintertime weather is just absolutely fine for them. Suzanne asked, can you dry your own herbs in the microwave or do you just let it sit on the counter till it dries? Um, I really don't know if you could do it in a microwave or not. I've never tried. I do own a, uh, we got um, an air fryer that my wife hated because you can't, the way it's designed, it opens from the front and it has little shelves or racks in it. So it's terrible for air frying food because you can't get anything of any size other than a handful of French fries in it. But you know what? It has a setting for dehydrator, and it's perfect for dehydrating um, herbs, Cuban oregano, I dried it, hot peppers, I dried a ton of hot peppers, does a great job on them, keeps the air circulating, has a timer, but if you don't have one of those, you can do it in the oven, you just have to set it at a very, very low temperature, and open the door a little bit, because you don't want to cook your herbs, you just want to dry them. Now, traditionally, you can take plants, either a branch off of it or a whole basil plant, hang it upside down, tie it together with string or thread, and dry it that way. Traditionally, we've done that for thousands of years. Problem is, if the humidity is high here, it may mold. But if the humidity is low here, like it is today, right now, you can dry things that way. So you want to be careful with it. A lot of information online. University of Florida has a lot of information on drying and preserving herbs also. But microwave, I double check that one before I tried that one. I looked at and look up some information. Jess says she does hers in the oven. Paul says, let it sit on the counter about a week. Air drying is fine, but you have to check the weather. If it's during the summer and super high humidity, it may mold before it completely dries. That's just because of the humidity. Zoom user says a lot of air fryers also have a dehydrator function. That is what I have and use. I love it. That's the only thing we use it for anymore is for me to dehydrate stuff and I get a good amount of use out of it. Josh says, I've tried to grow rosemary several times. I know you touched on it, but can you elaborate a little bit more? Wayne said, I purchased a small rosemary plant several years ago and planted it in my raised bed. I've let it alone other than harvesting. It's now about three feet tall and four feet across. I've killed rosemary before. You can't let it dry out too badly. It almost always comes down to, you know, if you start it or have it right now in a pot to get it larger and healthier, proper watering. So make sure it doesn't dry out too badly like I do. 
make sure you don't overwater or leave it out where it's getting rained on too much because it will drown. So if you manage the water, the irrigation on it, it should do pretty well. There really are very few diseases on rosemary. I've seen different um, unusual fungal diseases on the leaf. If you look really closely at the rosemary, it's like almost needles. Like picture a tiny little evergreen bush and the leaves are needles. If the needles start getting furry or something growing on them, it may be a disease issue. In that case, if you get really good close up pictures and send them, I could probably try to give you a better idea of that. But I know where I have always failed with rosemary before is I'm terrible at watering. I let things get too dry, then I water them, then they get too dry again. So keep trying, purchase another one. They can grow very, very well here. Alicia asks, how long can you keep fresh dried herbs? If you dry them and you get them good and dry. They're, they're, what happens to herbs is they don't magically like go bad or totally lose their flavor overnight after i would think about a year the flavor that you're getting from them starts to decline bit by bit so now if you pull out oregano that you bought 10 years ago and you forgot because you don't use it very often it's like this oregano tastes like nothing now probably because it tastes like nothing the oils are all gone so i would think um try to use dried herbs within a year or two tops. If it still has a good smell and it's still tasty, then use it as long as it looks safe. There's nothing furry growing on it. Make sure you get them thoroughly dry because that is what's going to keep them safe from a fungus or something growing on them. I'd say one to two years. Margarita says lemongrass tea is very good for the kidneys. I knew the people on here watching today would have lemongrass. Cecile says, yes, I got a lemongrass plant when it was very tiny. Within two years, it got taller than the house. Had to trim it down. It's beautiful. It makes a very flavorful tea. Mine grow in partial shade, which is probably why they only get four feet tall. They're a very attractive um, plump grass or decorative grass. My wife likes them very much. And she doesn't even know that I'm growing them to eat. She thinks it just looks nice. Um, Wayne says, I thought cilantro seeds were coriander. That is correct. Coriander is the same as cumin. People in Europe use the term coriander. Here, some people say coriander, but other people call it cumin. So I believe technically coriander and cumin are the same. It all comes from the same plant. It's just the leaf is a different name from the dried seed, if that makes any sense. So kind of same names for the same thing, but that's okay. Whether it's, you're growing it for leaves, whether it gets away from you, you let it you know, go to seed, you save the seeds, it's all good. It's all useful, all edible, all tasty, all healthy. Nope, I think I answered that one. I, I know cori technically coriander is a European term. Everybody over there calls it calls calls it cilantro and cumin. It's all coriander to them. So, uh, Dawn, glad to see that you're able to get on here. It's been a great addition. Oh, you're on spring break. Must be nice. Yeah, I'm working today. So. Uh, you guys are all very welcome. Paul, and this is a good question. We're going to wrap it up. We're going to take, I don't know, maybe two or three more questions here real quick. Uh, Paul asks, how can I get coriander to leaf and not go to seed so quick? I've had the same problem and coriander or cilantro. Let's not get back into that again. If you're growing seeds from cilantro, to grow the nice green leafy stuff that you want to put fresh in salsa. That's what I grow it for. It tends to want to bolt and go to seed very quickly. 
And when it does that, it's not making leaves. So you don't have any stuff to eat. Try growing it when it's really cool, when the weather is really cool, because heat definitely makes it bolt quickly. It's very heat sensitive and will bolt very quickly when it warms up. Or if we're having a warm winter, a lot of kind of days in the 80s, then it gets cooler, then days in the 80s again, that messes it up. Try to grow it during the chilliest times of winter and full sun, but really not much more than six hours of a day. Like I said, after a certain point, like once we get into February, forget it. Your cilantro is going to bolt. My bolted needs to come up. You need to put something else in that container. So it's probably the most sensitive to warm temperatures. You are all very welcome. Like I said, please follow us on Hernando Extension, allboneword.com for all of our upcoming uh, classes, whether it be on vegetables or herbs or fruit trees. Um, Bray says, does a plant light work as good as direct sunlight? Um, a lot, and uh, Karen commented on here, um, and you're correct. In many cases, yes, depends on the light. But if you have a proper plant light, you need to get that light as close to the leaves as you possibly can. So having the light way up here, the plant down here, the plant will always try to stretch to get to the light. Have to keep that light right above the leaves. As the plant grows, keep moving the light up and up. But a lot of people do successfully grow a lot of things indoors. We won't get into everything they grow indoors. But you can grow everything from herbs are very easy to grow indoors, fruits, vegetables, good way to avoid soil pests, some of the insect pests that are outside. Um, Francis says most of my herbs and other things that we might call weeds will be used for teas and uh, infusions and everything for massage. That's great. You can find a lot of information and learn a lot about it. Cecile says, can you propagate lemongrass? Yes, you can. If you have a friend who's got a big club, you take a really sharp shovel and shovel off a little bit of it. All you need is a little, little bit, plant it, and within the first summer, it's going to be a big bunch. If you have big bunches, you can take them, dig the whole thing up, take an axe, a machete, or a sharp shovel, chop it up into little chunks, and start 20 lemongrasses. It's one of those things that within a couple of years, if you want to fill your yard with lemongrass, pretty easy to do. You can make a whole bunch of plants the next year. You know, you can you can replicate them exponentially if you want. So Elisa says, how often should we water? As needed. If you're growing herbs in containers, remember the rule that if you have a container, little plant, only takes up a little bit of water, a little bit of nutrients. Bigger plant takes up more water each day, more nutrients. Big plant, sunny weather, takes up a lot of water, and it may your container only has so much moisture in that soil, it's going to dry out very quickly. So when you start little plants, keep it watered as necessary. That may only be once every couple of days or less depending on the weather, temperature, sunlight, a lot of factors. When you get big herbs growing in a container, check them every day. It may need to be watered every day. You know, a tomato plant growing in a container, full size will take up one gallon of water a day. So if you didn't water it every day, it's going to completely dry out and wilt and be damaged. Um, Foster asks, will a shade screen help in the summer? Yeah, shade screens can be very, very helpful to block part of the sun and kind of extend your growing season a little bit deeper into summer. <clears throat> we have a question from Karen. Uh, can you say if any herbs would be perennial in New York State up in 6A? Wow, You're, that is way outside of my physical zone of expertise. Um, I do have my assistant, Teresa, who is from New York. She knows uh, a lot more about New York and New Yorkers and pizza and things like that. Maybe she can chime in. Um, 
I guarantee you that you can grow a lot of herbs up there all summer long because that's the kind of summer weather where you can grow these things. Here, summer just gets way, way, way too hot. Uh, Jess asked, what is the best natural way to keep critters off of the herbs? I've heard neem oil. Neem oil is going to work for most problems. Herbs have very, very few insect pests. Most insects really don't like them because the oils in them, they're very strong, smelling and strong flavored to the insects. So not many of them are going to feed on them. Uh, let me scroll through here and I'm just going to pick one more question because I don't want to ramble on for too long here today. If anybody has any other questions, if you go to that HernandoExtension.com, every Thursday morning at 10 or almost every Thursday morning at 10, we have a one hour virtual play clinic. So you can go on either Facebook Live or YouTube Live, tune in live. You'll have me on there live. And you can type in and ask your questions, email pictures, and we'll all try to figure out what is going on and how to solve that problem live all at the same time. Keep in mind, if you're not free normally from 10 to 11 on Thursday, it's all recorded. It's all saved on our Facebook page. You can go there and just check it out every week to catch what you may have missed. But if, for, for people who have other questions, if you jump on the um, virtual plan clinic, we have somebody on there just about every Thursday. We rarely have to take a Thursday off. Um, so last question, and this is kind of an herb, kind of maybe not quite an herb, but Alicia asked, I planted my bulb onions, but they didn't bulb. Why? How do I get them to bulb? Onions are either long day onions or short day onions. You have to grow short day onions here because what makes them, what triggers them to bulb and get big onions is when the days start to get longer in the spring. It's opposite up north. They grow their onions during the summer. Days getting shorter is what makes the onions get into big onions. So Alicia, maybe you did not plant the correct variety of onion. You have onions take a hundred or more days to grow. So if you plant them from seed, you need to start the seed here in like August, plant them in your garden by September, let them grow all winter, and you're going to be picking them like in East around Easter, so April ish. So they take a long time to grow. Maybe you didn't get them in early enough. Or it's still not too late right now if they're still in the ground. Be patient. They may bulb up because they do so pretty quickly, pretty soon in the not too distant future. Because if you got the correct onions, what triggers them is the days getting longer. Onions can sense that. And all of a sudden, oh, boom, I'm going to go from a big, fat, healthy onion with a small onion to it's going to make a nice big onion that you can pick and eat. I've grown onions before in Central Florida, really easy. Takes a little bit of time and effort. You have to um, keep an eye on them. Other than that, I got probably a bushel or two of beautiful onions in a fairly small space. So guys, looks like we're uh, a bit after noon here at this point. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me go ahead and turn off the recording here.